get started. You should see Keynote up here on my computer. So what are we talking about this week? We're talking about strings and lists. And really we're talking about strings, but we have to talk about lists because a string is a form of a list. Now, we will go into in-depth into lists and collections in module five. Um, but for now, we're just going to introduce a little bit of lists so we can understand strings better. So what is a string? Simply, in Python, a string is an ordered collection of characters that's surrounded by quotes. Now you can have it surrounded by a pair of single quotes or a pair of double quotes. But the quotes have to be evenly balanced. For every time you open, have an opening quote at the beginning of a string, you have to have the identical quote at the end of a string. And they have to match. There can't be additional quotes, unescaped quotes, inside of a string. A string is immutable, which means it cannot be changed. You can't just swap out a character in the string. So Python has a way around that, and basically what you end up doing is you end up creating a new string from an old string, and Python makes the modification for you. So let's just take a look at an example. When you see in your script, Meister, now I'm going to go, and I'm going to say this a lot, and I'm going to say it a lot next week. Meister is a variable. We know it's a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. On the right-hand side of the single equal sign, we have the value. And in this example, the value of Meister is a string, and the string contains the characters, this is a string. And you will see that it has an opening double quote and a closing double quote. So those quotes are balanced, and that's what we have. That's what you see in your script. What Python sees is the name of the variable, which is Meister, and a value, which is an individual set of, it's a set of characters in a specific order. And notice when you look at those little blocks at the bottom of the page, you will see a block for each space. That's because a space is considered a character in a Python string. There are lots of invisible characters, and that's what a space is. It's an invisible character that are actually considered characters to a programming language that we wouldn't necessarily look at as a character if we were just thinking about English. But this, in general, is what you see in your script and how Python handles that inside its memory when it's running. Okay, and I'm going to say this a million times. For every opening quote, there has to be a, a closing quote of the same type. This is, and I say this a lot because this is one of those easy mistakes, mistakes that are very easy to make, especially when you're new to programming. Um, so you have to remember to balance your, your quotes, and I'm going to say that a lot tonight. So what is not a string? Let's take a look at some examples. So when I see in my script, this is a string, but you'll notice there's a missing quote after the G. Python does not consider this a string. This will get you a syntax error, and it won't get you a syntax error when you expect it to give you a syntax error. And I'll show you some of these syntax errors in a little bit. So I have it again, Meister, this is a string. I have an opening double quote, and I have a closing single quote. Again, this is a syntax error. While you have an opening quote and a closing quote, they are not the same type. So if you open it with a double quote, you have to close it with a double quote. If you open it with a single quote, you have to close it with a single quote. And this is a string. Now, I've opened it with a single, a double quote, and I've closed it with a double quote, but I've added a quote inside because sometimes you just want to use a quote as a character, 
and not as a delimiter for the beginning or the ending of a string. And in the next slide, I'm going to show you how to fix that. But these are all not strings to Python. You may think they're strings, but they're missing something, and they cause syntax errors. So my rule again, for every open quote, you must have a closing quote of the same type. So how do we correct those syntax errors? Well, first of all, the first one is pretty easy. It was missing a closing quote. So we're going to add a closing quote. The second one, still pretty easy. It had an opening double quote and a closing single quote. So we're just going to replace the closing single quote with a closing double quote. Now the final one, we have an opening double quote. We have a closing double quote. That's all correct. In the middle, we have this double quote that we wanted to use as a character rather than a delimiter. How do we handle that? We escape the double quote. And I'll show you a little bit more about escapes later, but it's a special um, an indicator to Python that says, even though you as Python have a different use for a quote, right now I want to use it as a character. I don't want to use it as saying it, this is either the opening or the closing of a string. And there are other characters you do that with too. Um, and there's my first rule again. And they have to be the same type. You, can, you will also, if you have a quote of the same type inside a string, you're going to have to escape it. Okay. So in the beginning I said a string is an ordered list of characters surrounded by quotes. So we've just looked at the surrounded by quotes portion of this. Now we're going to look at the ordered portion. So what you're going to see in your script, this is a string. What Python sees is this is a string and all those little boxes are because those are individual characters, those are individual pieces of data to Python that we have gathered together as a collection. Everything in blue is a collection. Like, you know, you have a collection of baseball cards, you have a collection of dolls, in Python you have a collection of characters. And these characters have order. So what are we talking about with order? Well, we're talking about every single character in this collection has an associated number. Now you don't have to do anything to get that associated number. Python gives you that associated number because you've put it in quotes. So, and that's how Python keeps order. Now you can read this ordered list as T is at index 0, H is at index 1, I is at index 2, and so forth. So that is how you read. Just like I said last week, we talk about writing programming languages, but we don't talk about how to read them. This is how you read this. This is how you read an ordered collection. You could easily say space is at index 4. So I know based on the position where I'm at in this list. Now another thing to notice, you will notice that the first number in the index is zero. Everything in a list in Python, whether it's a special list that handles strings or later on when we talk about lists in general, every list in Python starts at zero. Not one, but zero. So the capital T is at index zero, which is going to be interesting when you go to look at the length. Because you'll see for this is a string, it starts at index zero and it ends at index 15. However, there are 16 characters. So when we go to actually pull individual characters out, because we're going to do that. A little later on, we're going to talk about splitting, we're going to talk about slicing. Um, you have to remember that because you start at zero, the last character is always going to be one less 
than the length. And I'll show you what kind of error you get if that doesn't happen. So every character in a string it has a numerical placeholder, and I will use the word index for that numerical placeholder. So now we're going to foray into lists for just a few minutes because we have to understand a little bit about lists before we can continue talking about strings. A list is an ordered collection of elements. It can be an ordered collection of letters. It can be an ordered collection of numbers. It is an ordered collection of something. And the something can be anything. It can be objects. It can be other lists. Lists are mutable, which means they can be changed. So when you see a list, you see something like this. I have my list. My list is a variable. I know it's a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. On the right-hand side of a single equal sign, we have some new syntax, nomenclature. We have an opening square bracket and the word Lisa, the string Lisa, a comma and a space, and the number 42, a comma and a space, and a floating point number 3.14, and a closing square bracket. So, what is this? This is a list. The name of the list is my list. And the value are, the values are Lisa, which is at index 0, 42, which is at index 1, and 3.14, which is at index 2. So, instead of just having each individual character as its own element like we have in a string. A list can have more things in it. A list can have a string as an element in the list. But the same concept, could everybody mute please? The same concept holds true. Every single element in the list has an index and that index starts at zero. Okay, so to correctly define a list you have to open it with a square bracket you have, you'll have an element. If there are multiple elements, you will have a comma between each element, and you will close it with a single square uh, bracket. So, And the brackets have to be balanced. If you start with an opening square bracket, you have to close with a square bracket. If you don't do that, you'll get errors, and I can show you what those errors are. Um, so let's start with a square bracket. They can contain an element of any type. Everything in a list has a corresponding index. And all list elements are separated by commas. Okay. So now we're going to talk about a topic that will keep going through this class. It's called CRUD. Create, read, update, delete. This is what you can do with collections, this is what you can do with strings, this is what you can do with dictionaries, it's all CRUD. And this is in fact a known acronym. So create is you create a new list. Read is you get at the data within that list. Update is you modify something within the list. And delete is either you remove an element from the list or you remove the entire list. So that is what CRUD is. We're going to use it here. We, I use CRUD um, throughout this class so that people can understand what it is we're doing at any point in time. So let's talk about creating. I have an empty list. I can create an empty list by just having the open and close square brackets on the right hand of a single equal sign. So in this case, I have a variable name. We know it's a variable because it's on the left-hand side of the e equal sign called my empty list. I have an equal sign, and to the right, I have an opening and closing square bracket. So that gives me an empty list. I can create a populated list, which is what I did on the last page. I have something, a variable called my list. I know it's a variable. It's on the left-hand side of the single equal sign. On the right-hand side, I have a list, and that list has three elements. I know it's a list because it's yeah, sure. a square bracket. And um, could you please, whoever's sneezing, could you please, uh, oh. Mike? Thank you. Um, and you have to close it with 
a closing square bracket. Okay, so we, we know how to create them. How do we get at the information in them? Well, we get at the information in them using the index. So what I have here is I just have a print statement. Okay, we, we learned how to use print statements last week to take things and put them in, you know, show them up on the console. So with my list, I have a variable called my list. I know I have a variable. I have it over here. I know that variable has data in it because I can see it. And what I do is I use variable, open, square bracket, the index of the thing I want, and closing square bracket. So this is how you read data from a list. Read an element from a list. That is how you do it. And visually, when you look down here, you see my list. You'll see zero and Lisa. And that zero directly corresponds to the zero inside those brackets. And it will get you the word Lisa. So I can also print my list of two. Same thing. It's going to be 3.14. So. I'm going to go, we're going to look at crud.py for a minute. crud.py. Okay. Okay. So, what I have here is create, read, update, and delete. So actually, I'll show you this after I talk about updating and deleting. Changed my mind. OK, so that's creating and reading. This is update and deleting. So update is I want to change out an element in the list. So I have Lisa 42 and 3.14. I have my list of 1 equal 25. Well, what's going to happen is I am telling Python the value for the, the, the second element, so where my list at index 1 is, I want to change that value to 25. It was 42. I've just changed it to 25. That is what updating does, and that's how you do it. You take the variable name square bracket, the index that you want to change, and another closing square bracket. And that's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. And on the right-hand side of a single equal sign is the value that you are going to change. So it's very much like changing a variable, except you're changing part of that variable, because that variable contains a list. It contains a collection. So I, have, I can also update by adding things to the end. So I have this function that Python gives me called append. And Python has a huge amount of lists and dictionary functions and string functions that all just come with the language. The append function says, take whatever I am giving you inside the parentheses for this function. and Put it on the end of a list. Just add another element. So what my list dot append, the word add, quote, add, un, end quote, does is it simply creates a fourth element in my list, and it just tacks it onto the end. So now there are four elements in my list rather than three elements in my list. Deleting. Deleting can be one of two things. You can delete an element from a list you can delete the whole list. So if I have my list and I would say del, del is a keyword. The keyword means to delete. On the right hand side of del, I have the name of my variable which contains a list and I have the index. Now what happens, and I'm sorry it went a little faster than what I was speaking, is that Python removes the element, the zero element, and then it reorders everything. It says, OK, I've now removed the, play, the, the value at index 0, but I have to start at index 0, and it has to always be sequential. I can't skip a number. 
So that means what I'm going to do is I'm going to now take and I'm going to re-index everything. I'm going to take what was at index 1 and make it at index 0, and I'm going to take what was at index 2 and make it at index 1, and so forth. So it's going to reorder everything in the list based on the fact that you deleted an element. So now I have my element, and I want to now, instead of deleting the first element by using the del command, I can also remove an element by its value. So del, D-E-L, the keyword del, assumes that you're always going to use the index, so the in variable, and then the index value of the list. Remove says get rid of it off the end. That's what remove does. I'm sorry. No, that's not what remove does. Remove says get me the element that has this value and get rid of it. So in this case, we have remove and we have add, the word add. So Python's going to go out and it's going to look through my list and it's going to say, okay, I found the word add, so I'm just going to remove that element. And in this case, the element happened to be at the end of the list. You can also delete an entire list. The way you delete that entire list is use the del keyword and then the variable name of the list with no index afterwards, which means just get rid of the whole thing. So now let's go and look at a little code. Okay. So I have this, it's just crud, and again, this will be up on the YouTube channel. And here I'm creating an empty list, and I'm going to print it, and I'm going to populate it, and then I'm going to do a few things. So let's run through this in the debugger, because as we found out last week, I do love a good debugger. So for those of you who didn't join us last week and are joining us this week, I'm just going to go over this quickly. The red dot is a breakpoint. I added that breakpoint when the, when the file came up. All you do to add a breakpoint is click by the number and then unclick. What a breakpoint does is it stops the running program in its tracks and allows you to um, evaluate what's happening before that line is executed. How do I know what line it's on? Because of this blue. This blue line here says, I'm stopped, you are about to execute this line. So when I use these keys down, these buttons down here, this one is step over, I will then tell Python, okay, now actually execute that line of code. Change what's in your memory space, create my variable, all of that. So I'm going to step over, and you'll see a few things that have happened. First of all, because PyCharm is very handy. It tells you that you have created a variable called my empty list, and it's just got the open and close square brackets. Additionally, down here in the lower left corner of the screen, what has happened is under variables, it says my empty list equal, and you have list, which is the type, colon, which is just a separator, zero, and zero means that it has no elements in it. So I created an empty list. Now the next line I'm about to execute is line four. I changed back to the console so you can see and I'm just going to print the empty list and when I print the empty list down here you'll just see an opening and closing square bracket because there's nothing in it. So now I'm about to execute line seven and I have my list equal Lisa comma 42 comma 3.14. So I have now created a list, got a space in memory. Python has named that space in memory my list, and it has carved out a space for the three elements in that list and their index numbers. So the nice thing about PyCharm is if I look at my list, there's a nice little arrow here. That arrow allows me to drop down and see which elements are in the list. It also tells me what the length of the list is, which is three. And it tells me what's at each index and the type. 
So at index 0 is the word Lisa. At index 1 is the number 42. At index 2 is the float 3.14. So that, that's very handy. So if you're ever in PyCharm and you're concerned about what's in your list, this is a quick and easy way to do it. One of the things I often suggest is if you are having trouble with a particular Zybox script and you need to check what your variables actually have in them, copy and paste it into PyCharm and then run it through the debugger. It will make your life much easier and hopefully you will spend less time being frustrated while you're learning to program. So, I now know I'm on line 11 because that's where the blue line is. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to print out some things from the list or I'm going to read data from the list. The first thing I'm going to read is my list of zero and that should get me the word Lisa. So let's go to the console, step over that line of code and I get my list of zero is Lisa. Now I'm going to print my list at 1, so I'm saying, hey, Python, what is the value at index 1 in the variable my list, in the list that my list points to? And Python's going to say, okay, it's 42. But in this case, because of the formatting that I'm using for print, I need to change that to a string or I'm going to get an error. So I'm going to then print out 42. I'm going to print out again the final one which is 3.14. So now I'm going to update and I'm going to update my list. Let's go back here to variables and frames. Right now this is what we see. We have Lisa 42 3.14. I'm going to say my list at index of 1 is now going to be 25. When I look down here it says my list at index 1 is 42. So watch down here when I step over that 42 changes to a 25. I have just updated my list. I have replaced the value at the second position. Index of 1 is the second position and I've changed it to 25. So if I go to the console you will see that I have Lisa 25 3.14. Now I'm going to append add. So let's go back to frames and variables. I have now added an index of three with the word add. And I'm now going to print my list, which has the new character in it. Now I'm going to get rid of, sorry, shouldn't have done that. I meant to go here. Now I'm going to get rid of the one at zero and you'll see down here that it did and I'm going to print it. You'll see on the console that Lisa is no longer there and now I'm going to remove add. So it's going to go out, it's going to look for the value add and it's going to get rid of it and then I'm going to print my list again and the program is done. So while I'm sitting here, let's do a few things to cause consternation with PyCharm. First of all, this is something that happens very often. And what happens is you just forget to close a parenthesis. And I'm going to run it and this is what I get. Now it's very interesting and this is something I want you guys to remember when you're debugging. You will notice that my nasty little red air here says syntax error, invalid syntax, and it's pointing to the word print. There is nothing wrong with the word print. Print is exactly the same as it was two minutes ago. The problem is this is the first point in time which Python noticed a problem. Even though the problem occurs on line 7 and Python is telling me it's occurred on line 11. So when you are looking at Python errors and you're sitting there looking at line 11 and saying, I can't find anything wrong with line 11, start looking backwards. Start looking back up in the stack of your code because somewhere above, in this case line 11, 
there's a problem. And in this case, the problem was this. Okay? So now let's do something else. Let me just remove this close quote. And I'm going to run it again. So now you'll see this EOL while scanning string literal. Python doesn't know what in the world to make of this. Um, and it's pointing to the end of this line here. Well, that's because Python doesn't understand where the end of the string should have been. And I just took away the end of the string. So if I do something like this and I add a single quote and I run it, you will also see the exact same error because I do not have balanced quotes. So if I add a double quote, life becomes happy again. Um, so I think we're good with this one. All right. So now, why did we talk about lists? A string is a list that can't be modified. So why, how in the world do you change a string? We just spent all this time talking about updating and deleting elements. Well, there is another way to do to modify strings in Python. And that is because Python will create a copy of the string with a modification in it. And that's what you have to remember. You're never actually changing a string. You're making a copy of that string. And Python is making the modification while it's making the copy. OK, and CRUD kind of applies here. Create and read are just the same as they would be if you were using a normal list. Delete only works to delete the entire string. And update will create a new string but with the modification. And this is something that some students um, find a little bit difficult in the beginning because they just want to make a change to the string. And it makes sense to them to just make a change to the string. But Python is actually making a copy, and that's an important distinction. OK, cred for a string. Creating a string, we've already seen this a couple of times. You can create an empty string with no characters in it. You can create a string with characters in it. Read. We read a string the exact same way we read a list. If I want to know what is at index 0, I will have the variable. In this case, it's Meister. I will have an opening square bracket. I will have the index. In this case, the index is 0. And I will have a closing square bracket. Um, I can get the tenth element from Meister. And that's going to be an S. So how do I? read and create a string at the same time. So there's something called slicing. Let's say I want to get only the portion of a string. I don't want to get the entire string. I want to get just a substring. So how do I do that? What I do is something called slicing. And what slicing is, is it is a way to pull out a portion of a string using the indexes. So if I'm looking here, I have this new syntax. I have, first of all, on the left-hand side, I have my new stir. My new stir is a variable. Because when Python slices, it's going to create a new string, and you've got to have some place to put it. So whenever you're doing string slicing, and ever you're doing splitting of a string, you always have to remember to have a variable on the left-hand side of a single equal sign because Python is going to create a new string and put it in that variable. On the right-hand side of my single equal sign, I have my variable which contains the original string. And then I have the open square bracket. And after that, I have two numbers separated by colon. What this is telling Python is, starting at index 10, the colon can be written as go to index 13. Just give me those characters in a new string. 
So in this case, it's going to go and get 10, 11, and 12 because 13 is not included. The end is not, the last one is never included, whether you're doing slicing or ranges or things like that. So it's going to get 10, 11, and 12. And it's going to return that as a new string, and that's what's going to be in my new stir. Um, when slicing the start index is inclusive and the end index is not inclusive. So that is string slicing and you're probably going to need that in a lab this week. So let's stop for a minute and we're going to do challenge 2.9.1. Okay, so let's look at challenge 291. Okay, so Let's set up the configuration. Uh, where did it go? 291. So I have, this is just the challenge, I'm going to have a starting and an ending index. And I am going, I've got a, a lyric, a rhyme, the cow jumped over the moon. And I want to create a portion of that. I don't want the whole thing. I want a portion of that. Maybe I want cow jumped. So how do I do that? Well, I do that by saying I'm going to have a, I'm going to get a start index as input from a user. I'm going to get an end index from a user, and then I'm going to create my sub lyric. And this is just an example of slicing. So because I love the debugger, we're going to go through the debugger. And I'm going to go to the console. I'm going to step over the first line, and I'm going to say one, two, three, one, two, three, four. And then I'm going to say seven is my end index. Oops. And so now I've got I've got my rhythmic my rhyme lyric, and I'm going to get a slice of that lyric. If I'm good, it's the word cow, and I'm going to print cow. Now let's see something else. If I'm just going to run it this time, what happens if I put in minus 1 and 3? I get nothing. So Python didn't give me an error because Python's good about that, but it returns nothing. So sublyric is, in fact, an empty string. Okay, so let's go and do a little more string slicing. Of course, I'm talking about string slicing because you're probably going to have to do it in a lab, and we will get to the labs. So I have a variable called my newster. My newster is on the left-hand side of a single equal sign, and I want to get everything in the string starting at index 8 to the end of the string. So how do I do that? I do that instead of having to worry about counts and lengths. Python gives me a way to do that by simply not having a number after the colon. So when I see my stir, open square bracket, 8 colon, close square bracket, that is shorthand to Python that says, give me everything from index 8 to the end of the the string. So if I do the opposite, which is saying my new stir is my stir, open square bracket, colon for close square bracket, what this is telling Python is everything from the very beginning of this string through the through index 3, so it doesn't include index 4, so the first four characters, give me those back as a new string. So this is just shorthand. You could have done it a different way. I could have said my stir of 0 colon 4, and that would have worked the same. So this is just shorthand, and it's good to know. How are we doing on time? Okay. So there are lots of string methods. Python gives you all kinds of string methods. So you can do things like find a value in a string. I can get the index value of 
a of the first instance of the letter S by using a command called find. I can replace a portion of a string by using the replace function. So what replace will do is it will look for the word this and replace it with the word that. I can count the number of times a character occurs in a string. So if I want to know how many times I occurs in a string, it occurs three times. Now why have I picked on these three? I've picked on these three because you're probably going to have to use them in a lab or two. So the other thing to know when you're thinking about strings, and it's probably not too early to do this, is And yes, I do use Google as a tool. So Python has exceptionally good documentation for everything. So if I want to know about strings, I can go and look at strings on the Python documents. And it will tell me everything I ever wanted to know about strings, including all of the functions. Okay, It'll tell me what the... Um, about the formatting and what the options are and integers and hexadecimals and everything that has to do with a string, it will tell you including the functions associated with a string. So lots of stuff um, so yes, lots of stuff and there's also other stuff on the internet. The other thing I like to go to is W3 Schools. W3 Schools is a great place to go to just get the very basics in a quick and efficient manner. So these are two sites I recommend to the class. Um, I don't have a problem with any of my students going out and getting help from a legitimate source like W3 Schools or PyCharm or sorry, or the Python documentation. And if you're looking at here, you can see their examples on slicing strings, and you can try it yourself. So there's lots of information out there that's good and available, and I want to start getting you guys used to this now. You don't have to program in a vacuum. Well, in, in, a, in a complete vacuum. You're not allowed to copy other people's work. But you can come out here and learn something from the internet. Um, some of my fellow professors would probably like to like beat me with a Nerf baseball bat, but I'm a professional programmer. I use the resources that I have available. These are the resources that you have available, so you should use them. Okay, so we've learned how to slice strings. Now let's learn how to split them and put them back together. So string splitting is to basically take a string and create a list out of it. So if I have a string and that string has a comma in it, and I want to make that everything, I want to make a list out of that with a comma as a delimiter, because that's what the comma is. It is a character that you are telling Python when you get to this character, make everything to the left of it, its own element in the list, and then go to the right and see what happens, and then do it again. So that's what a delimiter is. And in this case, a delimiter is a comma. Delimiter could, delimiter could be a space. Delimiter could be a letter I. Delimiter could be a colon. Delimiter just has to be a character, but it doesn't have to be a comma. Um, and so what happens is if I use the split function from Python, I will get back a list. And that list in this case has two elements, first and second. Now you'll notice here the syntax is always going to be, the left hand side is the name of a variable. You know it's a variable, it's on the left hand side of a single equal sign. On the right hand side of a single equal sign is 
the value, but the value is being created in real time by Python because it's using the split function. So I am creating a, I'm creating a value that will be put into the my list variable by using the split function. So I can also take strings and join them up. So let's say I have a list. My list it has the values first and second in it, and I want to join them. I want to just join them with nothing in between. I can use the join function, and you will notice this is a little bit different syntax. You'll notice that I have myster, left-hand side, on the right hand side of the single equal sign I have empty quotes dot join my list so basically what that is telling Python is what is in that quotes is going to be my delimiter so on the split side I said comma is my delimiter on the join side I could have said comma is a delimiter but I could also say nothing is a delimiter. So on the join side, in this case, I said there's nothing that's a delimiter. So just butt the two things up together and give me back a string. And that string will have the words first and second, and they'll just all be together and create me the individual indexes. So splitting takes a string and makes a list, and joining takes a list and makes a string. Um, String formatting, what time is it? Okay, string formatting, there's lots of different ways to format a string, but one of the most handy methods is using a format specifier. And basically what it, is, it allows is it allows parameterized um, string formatting and you don't have to worry about converting your types. That's what format gives you. Format will do all those type conversions for you. You don't have to worry that something is a float or something is an int or something is a string or something is a list or whatever. Python does that for you if you use the format correctly. So what I have here is I have a print statement. And the format doesn't have to be used in a print statement, although it often is. It just has to be used against a string. So the print, after the print statement, of course, I have my opening parentheses because print is a function. I have a, a double quote because I'm starting a string. And in that, I have some very interesting things. I have the words I'm, a space, and then I have the opening and closing curly brackets. I have the word and, I have the word it's. I have an opening curly bracket, colon dot to F, closing curly bracket space and then open and close in curly brackets. What in the world does that mean? The curly brackets are placeholders. In, this, in the context of a string, the curly brackets are placeholders. So each one of those curly brackets is waiting for a value to be dropped in. Now how do I know what value is going to be dropped in? I know what value is going to be dropped in because after the, la the closing quote of that string, I have dot format. So what I'm saying is on this string, call the format function and replace each of those curly brackets with a value. And by the way, here are the values. In this case, the values are num1 and these are positional. So num1 will always go to the first open and close curly brackets float one is always going to go to the second one. Now that second one has some special stuff inside of it. And what that has is colon dot two F. Colon dot two F is a format specifier that is used for floats. And what you're saying is I want to use this for a float and I want two spaces after the decimal. And then you have another at the end, open and, curl, open and close curly brackets which um, is for Meister. Okay, so that's a placeholder, that's a placeholder with a format specifier, and that's a placeholder. So here's just a another quick example of this. So I have num1 is going to go there, 
3.1415 is going to go there, and pi day is going to go there. The output is going to be, I'm 42 and it's 3.14 pi day. So now here's an, another example. Same information. It's going to say num1, my stir, and then float. It's not even going to get to the float. If you do not have, if you have a format specifier, like colon point 2f, and you do not give it the right type, you're going to get a syntax error. And in this case, if you try and put a string into a float format specifier, it's going to give you a syntax error. So let's look at 2.71. We may go over a little tonight. Okay, so here's 2.71. Okay, so we have basically, we're going to input a word and input a number. And then we're going to output the word and the number. This one isn't very interesting. Oh, here, this is what I'll do because this is a modification that I did uh, because I wanted to make it more interesting. Okay, so I'm just going to run this. Or actually, I'm going to debug it because that's what I do. And I'm going to debug it. We stopped at the first one. Now, for right now, I'm just going to run this so I can put in the inputs. And you'll notice over here, that there is a green arrow with a bar to the left of it. This is resume programming. When you're debugging, it will run to the next breakpoint. It'll run to the next red dot. So I'm going to go to the console. I'm going to run it to the next red dot. And I'm going to input hello. I'm going to input 42 and 3.14. So now you'll notice that I have stopped on line 5, I have my variables, and I'm just going to print user word and user number. And you will notice the format, I have the curly braces, comma, and curly braces. So what this is going to do is it's going to give me user word, a comma in between, excuse me, and then the number. So I'm going to step over and I get hello42, and now I'm going to do the same thing except I'm going to include my float, and my float has a 0.2f. And uh, let me do this one more time. And instead of doing 3.14, I'm going to do a longer number so we can see that. So I'm going to put hello, 42, 3.14. I have no clue after that, after what pi is. My apologies. So I am, whoops, my bad. There we go. So what am I going to do? I'm going to step over this. Now when I look down at the bottom of the console, and I'm sorry I can't make the console any bigger, what you will see is instead of 3.1415, whatever I typed, it'll be just 3.14. Now I'm harping on that because you're going to have to do that in a lab. So getting to the labs, now that we've talked about labs. Now, lab 2.12 is a special case. So we do not, in Zybooks and in this class, provide you all the information you need to have to properly solve lab 2.12. So I'm going to read through this with you, but I also include the solution the lab 2.12 on the YouTube site. It, it's uploaded, it'll be uploaded, the link will be uploaded there. Because you can't expect to use if statements and branching when we haven't gone over it well enough. We don't do that until next week. Lab 2.12 requires that. Now if you want to try and do it as a test to see if you, you know, if you've read ahead or something, go right ahead. But 
don't spend your time being frustrated because we haven't given you everything. I cleared this with the school. It's the only time it's going to happen. So what are we doing here? We're going to write a program where we're going to take we're going to take some inputs. We're going to take first name, middle name, and last name. Sometimes. <laughs> and the output is going to be last name, comma, first initial, dot, middle initial. But sometimes the input form might take first name and last name. And that's going to be last name, comma, first initial. But it could be either. We're not having two different groups of input statements. So that's where the problem is because you have to use branching to determine what your input was. And that's not fair. We don't do that until week three. So that that's what this does. I am going to show you what the flowchart looks like. Basically, you're going to declare a name. You're going to input the last name, the first name, the middle name. You're going to create a list. You're going to split the list based on a space as a delimiter. Now here's the part we don't know yet. We're going to say if there, if the list of the length is greater than two, then we're going to only put output the last name and the first. If it is greater than two, then we have to output last name first initial or, yeah, first initial, middle initial. So that's why the solution is up, um, is linked to the solution on the YouTube channel. Now for the ones that you actually are going to have to do, okay? Lab 2.13 is write a program whose input is a string which contains a character and a phrase, and whose output indicates the number of times a character appears in the phrase. So we looked at this as an example, and what we're going to do is we're going to declare myster. I'm going to input myster. I'm going to declare a list. I'm going to split myster into a list. I'm going to declare a variable called care count. I'm going to have to do this so that I actually have the right order. My apologies. I'm going to set care count to the character count of um, the, the number of characters of that, the, sorry. I'm going to set my variable care count to the character count. And there is a function to use for that. And then you're going to output the character count. And you will find out how to count the characters in section 2.10 and you will find out how to split the list sorry split the string into a list in section 2.11 okay this is a little bit more involved than we've done before as a program so we're going to prompt the user is going to enter two words and we're going to store those in separate variables okay you're going to output uh, three values on a single line separated by a space. Oh, two words and a number. So you are entering three things. My bad. Um, that's not difficult. We can use format. We don't have to use any format specifiers. We're going to then output two passwords. So we're going to combine the user input to format the password. So the first one is going to be the first word underscore the second word. And the second one is going to be the number, the first word, and the number again. And you can do all these with format specifiers. It's very, it's very quick. Um, and output the length of each password. So this is where you're going to use the len function. So here, I would suggest that when you create the password, you set the new password value into a variable. So you would have my, my password 1 is going to equal, and then however you're going to create the first password. My password 2 is going to be the second password. So you can just use the len function on them. So if I take a look at the flowchart, 
I'm going to declare the first word, I'm going to declare the second word, I'm going to declare the number, I'm going to input things. So I'm going to input all three. I'm going to declare another variable password one, another variable password two, and I'm going to set password one to num word one num. I'm going to set password two to word one with an underscore and word two. And then I'm going to output password one. I'm going to output password two. I am then going to output the length of password two and the length of password one. And all of those things can be found. What you're going to do is you're going to use format with the curly braces to create the passwords. And you're going to use the len, L-E-N, function to get the length of the string. What's, there's some of it that's in Zybooks 2.7, or both of those, the new stuff is in Zybooks 2.7. OK, so that is the lecture for tonight. Do you guys have any questions? Oh, sorry, that's my Alexa. <laughs> Par apologize. Um, does anybody have any questions? Sorry, yeah, I, Alexa is giving me a lecture. I do have one question. Um, so I'm seeing, you know, your instructions here, for example, on this lab 2.14, you're saying declare word one, and then you're also going to, like, input. So um, that just, I guess my question is, is it efficient to have like all these, I uh, guess, additional words if you're pre-declaring what the, the the variable is? Is it making it like too complicated or too you verbose? Don't actually have to in Python pre-declare the variables. Um, Flowchart okay. and next week when we also do when we start doing um, pseudo code, these are logical representations of what the language should do. So this is language agnostic. Okay. So you don't care that you're saying declare word one because it might that declaration might take um, might take in one programming language might be some syntax and another programming language might be another syntax. So I wouldn't necessarily declare a separate variable. I would just have variable equal input. Okay. But this is language agnostic, and so that's kind of the way you're supposed to do it. All right. And I just had another question about, like, uh, over-engineering or overdoing it for the assignment. Um, okay. So, like, for example, in the labs, uh, is the type of material that you're looking for, like, every line should be commented and... Um, I know that, obviously, we should be using the proper, like, spacing and everything. Um, but are you looking for like comments as well on every line? No, you don't need comments on every line. What I am looking for when I grade is I am looking for you to be able to communicate to me that you understand what you're doing, that you're not just sitting there scratching your head and hoping. Um, so a, a few comments in a few good places that say this is what I'm doing. I am collecting input and do all your input. I am creating password one, or creating password two. So comments, in the professional world, comments are meant to be clues to, and I actually have some colleagues who would completely disagree with me. They're meant to be clues about what the program is doing. But you shouldn't necessarily write a novel. I'm a pro professional programmer. I should be able to read that code and know what it's doing. If there's something special you want me to know or some understanding you want me to have, then you should put a comment. I have colleagues who write novels who have at least 50% of their code is comments. I don't find that that adds anything to the code. And for my students, I'm not going to ask you to do something like that. I want you to make sure that you can communicate to me that you are understanding of what was going on. But it doesn't need a comment per line. I don't, you don't need to go 
to that extent to prove to me. Okay? Thank you so much. And comments are also a good way. If you're getting stuck on a place and you haven't reached out to me or, you know, it's, you know, 2 a.m. or something, you can put a comment in here and say, I got really confused by this section. I don't understand. You do that, and I will probably tell you how to understand it better later as part of the grading of the program. Here's what you do. So, but, yeah, don't spend a million hours commenting. Spend the time getting your code right, and if you feel you need to add some comments, go ahead and add them. Thank you so much. No problem. Anybody else have any questions? How do I transfer uh, I to you? Go ahead. Hello? Did you have a question? I was asking, um, one, I, I guess, I'm actually in another class that, at at uh, SNHU, mm -hmm. and um, so wh why, why are, are you the only, I was told you're the only teacher that does this. Why are you the yeah. only one that does this? This is, uh, lecturing is not required under the contract. And the contract I sign, uh, the other contracts other teachers sign, there is no requirement to provide a lecture. I see. I am not a reading, writing learner. I could not learn this stuff by just sitting down and reading through my books. I don't just get things. I have to work through them to understand them. I do this for people like me. I work with some people who can read something and understand. They can sit down in an evening, they can read a programming book, and they completely can understand all the concepts. They might not be able to write it, but they can understand all the concepts. For me, the only way to do that is physically working through examples and problems and, you know, talking to myself about how I read things. So I do these lectures for the people who are like me because there are a lot of good people out there who are very smart that could be very good programmers that may get discouraged because they can only, the, only, the only reference they have is thy books. So that's why I do it. Do you teach any other classes here? I do not teach any other classes. I have taught a few other ones, but um, they keep asking me to do Python, and I've got all the material set up, so I don't mind doing Python. Because it takes a long time to create these slides. Thank you so much for doing this. Oh, you're welcome. I'm, I'm ho I, I hope that it helps. I hope that it helps students become successful in this class and move on with some confidence to whatever you guys are going to move on to. Anybody have any other questions? I just wanted to add on to the co on comments portion. If you work through the Zy books, you should be able to see some of the programs that they write, and they usually have pretty good like comments in their white spaces. Mm -hmm. So they're pretty good templates for what you might want to do. You might want to add some more on top for the description of the program or something, but their white space comments are pretty good examples. That is a very, very good point, and I don't, I haven't worked through everything in Zy books, so. I think that's a great point. Hi, Professor uh, Lisa. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you okay. <laughs> okay, I think I had myself on mute. Um, but yeah, I, I think that what you were saying before uh, the last person just spoke um, is kind of me. <laughs> um, I feel like when I'm reading it, I understand what it's saying um, as far as like the definitions and the actions and things like that but when it's time to kind of practice and put what I just read into action I'm kind of struggling with that so I, I do definitely appreciate these live lectures but is there any tips you can give because I'm, I'm trying to do better I, I just had a tutoring session yesterday but I just 
I don't know. I just feel like there's a disconnect for me when it comes to putting and doing the code, and I'm trying to get better at that. The disconnect is often, it often has nothing to do with syntax. The disconnect has to do with the fact that we don't do a good job um, in a lot of different kinds of schools of teaching you how to read a word problem and break that down into code. And that's where the disconnect usually comes. You know, you can look at keywords like input and output, but when you're looking at some of these things, you know, and it says output to passwords using a combination of user input, format the passwords as shown below. What in the world does that mean? How do you go from that grouping of words into working code? And that's where the disconnect, I think, happens. And right. so we have yeah, to learn so. to read that. So, and some of this is baby steps. There are three steps here. Start with step one. And, and this is another thing that we don't do well, and Zybooks doesn't do great. I like to program in baby steps. I write some pretty complex code. But I don't start by writing complex code. I start by writing simple code. And I add on to that code and I test. And I add on and I test. So if you're looking like at a lab, like we'll use 2.14 as the example, start off, ignore 2 and 3, and start off with 1. So you're going to get the input of two words and a number. And then you're going to output those three values on a single line separated by a space. Now there's a bunch of different ways you can do that. But we learned a really efficient way to do that using the format specifier. That is the first thing I would do. Don't care if Cybooks is going to be happy or not, if it's going to give you errors. You want to make sure those lines are syntactically correct and they do what they need to do. And if you're having some trouble with that, load them into PyCharm and play around. When you're good and solid with that, with number one, then move on to number two. So now number two basically, basically says, I have to create something, two new things out of this other stuff that I have. So how do I go about doing it? Don't try and do both of them. Do one. Do that first one. Test it out. Give it a bunch of different variables. See if you're getting what you would expect. And then do the second one. Again, test it out, try it with different values, and then go on to the third one. The third one is looking for length. Go back into Zybooks and say, how do we get the length of a string? And then do that one. So don't try and write the entire program at once. Baby steps. Get your input right, get your first calculation right, get your next calculation right, and go down the list until everything is right. More errors happen because people try and write a huge long program. You will find it less frustrating and easier to work through if you do it in small increments. Does that help, Courtney? Thank you. It, it did. I appreciate it. Any other questions? If two trains leave their station at the same time, <laughs> are they heading toward each other on the same track is the question, Tom. Um, so I'm going to take that as nobody has any other questions. This should be up on the YouTube site tomorrow around noon. And I apologize for not sending the email to all the professors last week. I will remember to send the email with the link to this particular lecture uh, tomorrow as well. Um, for anybody in my class, as always, please, please feel free to reach out to me before you get frustrated or upset. Um, and I hope everybody has a nice weekend. I'm going to stop the recording.